My name is Cal. I've met most of you in the room, but it is really nice to see faces that I have not met. Um, thank you so much for coming. This is my first redo as the gallery and studio manager. Um, and it feels like quite the accomplishment. I would also like to acknowledge Mary and Rhonda for their help all the time. <laughs> um, so we're just going to have some brief artist talks, if you will, some artist conversations um, with Pat Croft, who is our feature artist this month. Um, so the feature artist comes in every three months and just has this brief and really wonderful valued time adding a little spice to our collection. And then following Pat will be Amber Gavin, who is one of our represented artists, who is also part of the feature this month. Um, and this is a great opportunity for our, re our represented artists to try out something new, to kind of get a little spotlight on them, and just bring a little more foot traffic into the space, hopefully. So uh, without further ado, Pat? Church. You can come closer. <laughs> um, hey, so I'm Pat Croth. I'm from Verona, Wisconsin, which is just down the road where it's not raining. Um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, I am delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me here at the gallery. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I won't blab on too long, but if you have questions, please just kind of wave me down and um, fire away. I uh, grew up in Chicago. In fact, in December, it will be 30 years that we moved here to Wisconsin. And uh, it's really been great. Raised four kids here and uh, uh, you know, changed careers. And it's just been wonderful to become a Wisconsinite. Uh, so I grew up about five miles from the Chicago Loop and Lakefront and uh, very urban landscape. Um, my parents were not artists, just hardworking people, but they always provided us with crayons and paper and bags and boxes and encouraged us to just be creative and have at it and uh, also encouraged us to use the city as our campus. So we roamed the lakefront, got to museums and parks and um, I just had a really uh, supportive family and uh, I think that's what has encouraged me to kind of step off the cliff now and then and, and venture into the art world. But um, I initially started off as a painting major at DePaul University and um, kind of panicked my sophomore year and thought, oh my God, I need a real job. You know, what am I thinking? And um, I switched into PE and uh, ended up coaching gymnastics. And I was very fortunate to be in a very creative gymnastics setting with some other like-minded souls. My co-teacher co was a magician. So we do, we juggle and do magic during lunch. Um, but I kept painting and printmaking at night. So teaching during the day, making art at night, and doing some exhibiting. And, um, you know, got married, had three kids in Chicago, moved here to Wisconsin. And over time, the art drive just became more and more <laughs> persuasive. And um, about 15 years ago, I stepped off the cliff and started doing art full time. And um, during that time, a friend invited me to take a quilting class. And this is a very traditional quilting class with hand stitching, cutting with scissors, you know, no rotary cutters or all the nice gizmos we have now. And um, I fell in love with fabric. Um, I always loved working with color, but I really fell in love with working with the tactile nature of, of textiles. Um, so I became interested in crazy quilting. Um, if you're not familiar with crazy quilting, it's an old Victorian style of quilting where women would save precious bits of fabric, satins and silks and velvets, um, piece them together in kind of just a very crazed, type of design and then embroider or bead the seams. So lots of embellishment. So you can see where this is leading. <laughs> so um, I continued crazy quilting. I made vests and jackets and hats and just some fun pieces. And I got to a point where I was thinking, well, what is too small? Basically nothing became too small. Tinier and tinier bits of fabric became more and more appealing to me and nothing became off limits. So in my work, you can see that I've incorporated all kinds of things in my work. Um, there's buttons, there's obviously lots of fabric. These are all individual pieces of fabric behind this mosaic and montage of other things. 
but I collect and incorporate candy wrappers, paper clips, buttons, junk mail, you name it, it has worked its way into my work. Um, I really love working with color and I kind of embrace that as I go. Um, I don't necessarily work with a big plan ahead of me. The plan for this piece was purple and red. <laughs> <laughs> and I also listen to a lot of improv jazz while I work. So um, I think pervasive, especially in some of my larger pieces, I do like to work large. So I have pieces that are 10 feet, 8 feet long um, that are made in the exact same style as this, working with tiny pieces of fabric, um, plastic, plastic bags, candy wrappers, buttons, zipper tabs, cut up clothing, all these types of things end up in my work. Um, one of my larger pieces is called Revisiting Jackson. As an abstract painter, I always admire the work of Jackson Pollock, and so that piece is a black and white piece, 10 feet long, that was a homage to Jackson Pollock. It was recently uh, added to the permanent collection at the um, International Quilt Museum. So that's my big brag for the pandemic. Um, <laughs> so that, that was really, really exciting, and it was, um, it's very gratifying to see your work um, go to a museum, especially a piece like that, so it's really fun. But I like working on these intimate pieces as well, the framed pieces, and if you notice these gardens over here, these little flowers are made of candy wrappers. So I did not eat all the candy. My four <laughs> kids left me a stash of wrappers behind the couch one year after Halloween, so that's kind of how that got started. So um, yeah, I've, I'm continuing to work in this, um, Improv Fragment series is what I call it. I'm also uh, working on a few other se uh, series that are uh, improv jazz and um, some garden pieces, imp imp improvisational gardens. So um, yeah, I think I'm gonna, I'll be at the Winter Art Fair this weekend. Yeah. Did you say, I probably missed, yeah. how do you attach, how is that all? Everything is stitched. It, it, yeah, so I, I create a base of fabric. Sometimes I fuse that in place with an iron, so I'm using a heat bondable interfacing sometimes. Sometimes not. I just leave things loose on the surface. I pin it like crazy and then I stitch. So I use just a regular domestic sewing machine. So my machine opening is about this big, and even on the large pieces, I just kind of gradually work them through the machine. And I do a process, um, a stitching process, which is called free motion stitching. Those of you who are stitchers may be familiar with that. What that means is I can drop the feed dogs on my sewing machine. Those are the little teeth that pull the fabric through from the bottom. I either cover those or drop them, and that allows me to freely draw with my sewing machine. So it allows me just another um, creative design element. So I'm actually creating a linear element by adding thread work on the surface. So, sorry, I didn't, the long answer. <laughs> um, anybody else? Yeah, I looked really closely at the ones with the candy wrappers, and it's really hard to tell that any of those would be a plastic material. Right, yeah, it looks yeah. It's very fabric. Do you do yeah. anything to finish it that gives it kind of that finished look? Um, I think there are layers of netting on the surface, so sometimes, depending on the color of netting that I've used, they do become fairly homogenous looking, but I think a lot of that is the stitching itself because once I've got everything on the surface and it's become flattened by the stitching, it almost becomes like a, a solid piece of fabric. But yeah, if you look at them closely, because a lot of people will ask me, oh, did you print those on fabric? But they're the actual wrappers. And that's what a lot of my work is about. Um, I, a lot of my work, oddly enough, is inspired by nature, and my concern for the environment extends to recycling, reusing, and repurposing these materials in another way so they don't go into the landfill. So, yeah. Um, I recently built an installation using all of the plastic packaging material that came into my house during the pandemic. Um, so I had a 15-foot passageway at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts from May to July. Um, that was water bottles, berry boxes, salad lamp clamshells, strung from a 15-foot rafter, and there was a passageway that you had to walk through, so called the dangerous passage. So, yeah. Is that one in Cedarburg? Yeah, yes, yeah, Cedarburg. That's, 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 that, okay. Yeah, that, that's ex beautiful. that exhibit is no longer up. It was up from May to July, but you can see some images on my website. Okay. So, cool.
All right. Yeah. Where did you move to in Wisconsin? I'm in Verona. Verona? Yeah, so just outside of the city of Verona. So no cows on my property, but I, I do have chickens now, which is really, really exciting. So. Yes, yeah, so we just have a split level ranch and um, it became kind of interesting when we were looking for a house that our poor realtor, you know, is like, all right, you need an extra room. <laughs> I say, yes, I definitely need an extra room, but my extra room has now spilled into other areas of the house since my kids are gone, so <laughs> taken over. <laughs> so, very cool. Well, thank you so much. Yay! Take it away, Amber. Uh, so I'm Amber Gavin. I'm the potter. Um, let's see. To do the same kind of thing, I started uh, throwing when I was in middle school. Um, I was originally an athletic kid. I was a soccer player. Uh, and then I started to blow out my knees at a very early age. Um, so I had to pivot into a whole new area of interest. And my parents found ceramics classes for me. Uh, and I just kind of immediately bonded to it. So um, I've been throwing as a hobby for many years, 20, 25 years now. God, I feel old. Um, 25 years now. And uh, it was about 12 years ago when we bought our home down in Oregon, Wisconsin, um, right next to Verona, that I got my own wheel and my own kiln in my home so that I can throw just all on my own now. I don't have to go out to a studio anymore. So. Uh, I've just been throwing as a hobby uh, for a very long time, and then about four years ago, I started to try to see if I could make it pay for itself, because I was spending so much on materials and equipment, and so I started an Etsy online shop to see if I could sell any pieces, um, and it kind of just took off uh, on its own steam, and uh, I quit my full-time job about a year and a half ago, and now I do this full-time. <laughs> so. Um, I also did a big pivot uh, over the course of pandemic. Um, I was originally working in more traditional pottery colors, earthy colors, golds and coppers and browns and cream. And uh, then this year, you know, for whatever reason, I needed to bring some color and some happiness <laughs> into my life again. So I, I changed to a whole new kind of color. So I started doing the splatter paint and I started doing random watercolor <laughs> designs and got all new stuff and just had fun with it. And uh, it's been a really fun year um, going to in-person art shows again. Uh, as people have come into my booth at the fairs, they're just like, oh, this is different. This is, it's so happy in here. I'm like, that's what I was going for. <laughs> so I'm glad you like it. So people have responded really positively to the bright colors and the energy and so yeah that's what I've been doing uh, this year uh, and then th for this exhibit I decided to try to add light to it as well so I've already played with color this year and now I'm playing with light by making all of these uh, lanterns so they're all meant to have candles in them so that they light up and they can go on a tablescape and just bring some light and color to a room. So still functional, because that's the type of work I do, but more fun. So any questions? Yeah. Um, so I throw the pieces on the wheel and I let them dry usually for a day or two until they're still soft but not fully dry. Uh, and then I very carefully punched out the holes and made a massive mess. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have uh, some sharp uh, tools that I used for cutting um, knives and a, whole, a round hole punch, which is why the circle ones are nice and clean. Um, I actually sat out on the porch because uh, it was nice out and I just made a massive mess on the porch, which is, it's still there. It's still <laughs> technically there. I haven't cleaned it up. <laughs> Yeah, well, so um, another issue that we had over pandemic was all the supply chain issues. Uh, I was not immune to that. So a lot of my most popular glaze colors, I couldn't get the materials for them anymore. Um, 
from all different points in the chain. The, the mines where they harvest the materials were closed down, and then the trucks that would drive the materials to a processing plant were closed down, and the processing plant was closed down, and delivery was closed down. So I suddenly couldn't get the things that I liked to use, um, so I had to buy different colors that were just what was available on the shelves at the time. Um, and then the other thing I did was I bought a whole bunch of small paint, pints of ready-made glaze in just a bunch of different colors because I love trying new colors all the time. Every time they release a new color, I have to try it out. Uh, I saved all those empty jars and I let them dry out and then I crunched up all the dry glaze and I actually put it all together in an empty sprinkles container. <laughs> So I started dipping pieces in white glaze, and then while it was still wet, I just shake the sprinkler out on it. So recycling those materials rather than throwing them away, um, and you know, making something out of what I had since I couldn't get what I, you know, was looking for. Just on a whim, I'm like, I'm just gonna try this, <laughs> and I just love the way it comes out, and it's different every time, and. It's just, they're, they're messy, and they're fun, and they're unique, and I'm just kind of really enjoying them. Anyone else? <laughs> uh, next spring. I think next spring. Yeah, I think today was the last day that that might have happened, and <laughs> didn't happen. So, so Amber, yeah. is still on Etsy, right? It is still on Etsy, and yes. Um, so you can find my old colors, my fall colors, I actually have it sky high. It really fits their aesthetic up there. Um, and then I also have, I have some pieces at a gift shop in uh, the Green Bay area, uh, at a couple shops out in California and a couple shops out on the East Coast in Martha's Vineyard and Massachusetts. So not super local. This is my only gallery spot, which is what I'm, I'm really proud of having, like, gallery. It feels really nice. <laughs> no museums yet. That, oh my god, that's such a milestone. I, I'm like, <laughs> that would be really cool. I'm so happy for you. Why is it so important for your work to be practical? I love having things that are used. Um, I, I love visual art too. I mean, our house, we have so much 2D art on our walls. There's no space. Um, but I really love functional pieces, and I love uh, having it accessible to everybody. So um, not everyone can spend a lot of money on an art piece, but they can buy something like this, something small that they can bring into their life that's affordable and usable and just accessible for more people. So. Amber, the little pie plate that you have, yeah. tell me about that, because I love Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep, you have a set of those that I gave you last year. Um, yeah, so the pie plates, so I make standard nine inch pie plates and I make these personal pie size, which are really fun. I gave a set to Christine and her family um, so that you can, they're meant to be used. They're meant to go in the oven um, and they're just, they're just a lot of fun. <laughs> I know, I love about how you tested it. You know, you yes, it oh yeah, I, I'm like, these are, Pie plates are, they have a high breakage rate, so they crack all the time, they take up a lot of space in the kiln, so I'm like, if I'm gonna make these, they're, they're gonna be more expensive because they took a lot of space and a lot of time to make. And if you're gonna spend that much on a custom pie plate, it needs to work <laughs> and not break. So I made some different designs and different sizes, and I baked, uh, I made meatloaf and banana bread and pie and like all these different things in it. I put it in the freezer and then put it in a 400 degree oven. And I took it out of the freezer and I poured boiling water on it. And I like did all these kinds of stress tests to see at what point is it gonna break. And I think the only one we had crack was one of these small ones. Uh, my husband put a one slice of frozen meatloaf on the plate and put it in an oven and it cracked because it wasn't covering the whole plate. <laughs> that was the only thing that broke it. It was his fault, yes, yes, yes. I have one of the larger ones. Yeah. Um, and I love it for serving things, too, just using it as a serving. Yes, thank you. Yep, yep. So. Do you ever think that you'll do something not, like, um, functional? I 
don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, the, I've, I've made some vases and some like purely decorative pieces, which are still kind of functional. Um, but I, like, I'm not really a hand builder. I've, I've tried sculpting before, and uh, I've never had that talent to translate something from my brain into a sculpture. It just, it never turns out the way I want it to turn out. But something about wheel throwing and just that balance and making things smooth and round and, and thin shapes, and I just, I love doing that. It's just kind of my wheelhouse, so. Except for handles. I, hate, I will always make handles, but I will never enjoy handles. <laughs> They're the worst. Yes? Uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. Do you make a spoon rest? I do. Okay, good to know. Yes. I do on Etsy, yes. Oh, you do, so, you do have spoon rest. Okay. I'm used to it being like right there, so I keep looking over there. Do we have them in that color, that teal color that the pie plate is in? This one? We also have them in that, in a more muted fall color. Okay. So white Okay. <laughs> That's true. Off during the reception. During the reception night, yes, okay. yes. <laughs> yeah. I I do not. I get that question all the time, um, especially from like I, I get it a lot from parents for like their kids. Um, but no, I I've tried to teach my son. Uh, it's not gone great. So, um, you know, I, I learned in a really non-traditional way. Uh, I actually, I did art in high school. Like, I was the art kid, art club kid, right? I did, like, you know, private shows and stuff in high school. That's what I did. Um, but when I went to college, I'm a very practical-minded person, so I actually have a business degree. I did not go for art. Uh, and the ceramics classes I took were actually at a production pottery studio. So it was a fully uh, operational production studio where they made thousands of pieces. Um, and then they offered evening classes on the side, like when their employees went home, they had classes in the evening, you know, as another way to make money for the business. Like gnomes? Like no, no. Um, <laughs> no. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, they, uh, it wasn't like, that's like slip casting the gnomes. Oh, okay. They did, um, theirs was all throwing, so they made uh, like mugs. So sometimes you go to a restaurant and they'll have handmade mugs, but they're all like, sure. like really identical. Yeah, those come from production pottery studios. They also made planters. Um, but it, so I learned kind of from that direction of production pottery. Uh, those were the people who taught it, but it was still really fun. It wasn't for kids. My parents had to talk them into taking me. So it was me as like, you know, 13, 14, 15 with a bunch of 45 and 50 year old women. And that, that was the group. So um, it was a different kind of experience. Uh, so in college, I didn't take any art classes. Um, I just took business. And then uh, I was a IT and project manager for many years and just did this on the side. And now I'm back to doing this full time, which is kind of a weird, came, up, came around sideways. So I never, I never had like a private ceramics instructor. I didn't learn it that way, so I feel weird teaching it. I don't know, maybe one day. We'll see. I also, you know, I work in the basement of my home. There's no windows. It's small. I only have one wheel. It's not an attractive space. <laughs> so. I don't know, maybe one day when we buy a new home where I can have a studio on the ground floor and I don't have to carry my clay downstairs anymore, because... Yeah, yes, exactly. During the summer, I have Tristan. He, my son carries the clay downstairs for me when he's not at school, but... Uh, excuses, you know. <laughs> so, yes. Thank you. Thank you.